Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, the uh, social values in defence. Um, someone cunningly moved the and in the uh, the uh, the thing on the door, so we became a green, green and diverse local future. But actually, we're a green, diverse and local future, which is really looking at the whole embodiment of uh, of um, of social values. So. Um, very briefly, my name is Andrew Kinnebra. I'm Director of Make UK Defence, which is Make UK's Defence Trade Association. If any of you are not members, you're very welcome to join. We would love to have you in the family. Um, if you're a member of Make UK, you get a, a, a much discounted, uh, discounted um, subscription. Um, so very briefly, in case any of you are, are, are not members, I thought I'd just pop up a little bit about what we are um, and, and what we do. I'm, I'm not intending at all to read these out. The key one really is that we are passionate and I would emphasise the P word. We are passionate about UK defence sector um, and we're pressing the government on why they're not buying British uh, in, in every sector, why they're not using British made steel in all their construction projects. Um, there are some specific challenges in using armoured steel because we don't make it in the UK, but um, lots of other things. Why are the British government not prioritising at every opportunity by UK, by British. Um, and that's something we're pushing really hard. The joy of being a trade association is we haven't got any contracts at risk with the MOD. We get no funding from the MOD. We get no government funding. So we can say pretty much what we like within the realms of, uh, of reasonable behaviour. Um, but we push them pretty hard um, and we don't take no for an answer. So that is our job. And my, my friend and colleague from, from the MOD, Graham, uh, I think probably knows that, and uh, we're, we, that's our job, is, is to challenge and to where, where, where appropriate, hopefully. Um, so that's what we're about. Um, social values and defence, I'm, I'm probably surrounded by people who are much more experts in this than I am, but I thought briefly I would just mention, um, we, we ran a survey um, in January uh, of this year, um, and we asked our members to tell us what they uh, what they understood as, as social values, what they were, um, and whether they were making any changes to their business as, as they move forward. So the results here are quite interesting. You can see on the left-hand side um, that uh, the number of, or the percentage of companies that are fully aware of social values is about 19%, so relatively low. The middle portion is are aware but haven't done a great deal about it yet. And then on the right hand side, uh, not aware and, and not really responding to social values. Um, the big risk of doing that clearly is that 10% of the marks on any competitive tender now in, in, uh, in the world of public procurement, particularly with MOD, is predicated on your answers to the social value questions. If you don't have any answers, you're potentially losing 10% of the marks. That could well be the the the, uh, the difference between winning and losing a, a contract. So it's hugely important. Um, what we thought we would do just now, we've got, I think, a reasonable cohort, is that we would rerun those questions um, for you now. Um, now, I think um, we need to, need to get you to scan that QR code. Um, if you can, I don't know if you can do that from, from a distance. Or visit the Slido webpage, as James said. We're actually only going to be able to do one at a time, so we can't do Okay, so that's fine. We maybe start off with... So it, it's just a website, you don't need to download anything, it's literally you go on there and, and if you could um, go through those questions, we'd be, we'd be very grateful. Does everybody have that information down now? Okay, thank you. So moving on, really, as, as I mentioned, ignore these at your peril. 10% um, of the marks on any competitive tender. The challenge, and, and maybe Graham will, will speak to this when, when, he, uh, when he gives us his, uh, his address, um, is the single source uh, contracts, of which there are a great deal. A great deal of MOD spend is, is with single source contracts. So I guess why, why are they not subject to social value scoring in the, in the same way as competitive tendering? And, and what plans maybe are, uh, do MOD have in terms of rolling those out? Um, it, it's obviously as part of the wider, Clancy's going to talk, um, it, and I will introduce our speakers in a moment, but Clancy's going to talk more broadly about the um, environmental, social and governance side of, of, of being part of a FTSE 250, you know, big business, 
um, a big business, but not perhaps a major prime, if, if that isn't a, a rude thing to say. Um, so I think it'll be very interesting to see what, what, we, uh, what we hear from, from her. But this is clearly a move forward in terms of global, global governance and, and good practice in, in business anyway. But now, of course, MOD have linked that to scores in, in competitive tenders. So it's something that's hugely important. As, as I'm sure you all know, it's tackling economic inequality. I don't think we're allowed to use the levelling up uh, word anymore, but that's broadly speaking what we're talking about. Fighting climate change, so stewardship of the environment. And then finally, equal opportunity for all. Um, and that really covers a, a very wide gamut of, uh, of improvements in terms of broadening out the, the diversity in defence, which I think we probably would all acknowledge is, is not as diverse as it should be and as we would, as we would like it to be. Um, it will benefit your business, clearly, as, as I'm sure you, you're all very well aware. Um, but it, for, for particularly for SMEs and mid-tiers, it's very important not just to be able to answer the questions, but to actually be able to demonstrate those changes that you've made to your business. And most importantly, probably measuring where you are today and then that forward momentum moving, moving forward into the future. Um, that's a challenge when you're bidding, because if you're bidding for a small piece of kit, on, on, a, on a larger system, that's extremely difficult to link those jobs, those green credentials and those, um, those developments of, of new skills and, and new capabilities directly to that small portion of work. So um, what Make UK Defence is trying to do is to develop a, uh, a dashboard system whereby we, we ask you to complete a questionnaire um, and we will, what we'll try and do is endeavour to provide you with a sort of gap analysis of your social values and help a business to understand where those gaps are, perhaps offer some ideas of how you might address those gaps going forward. Um, so it's, it's, this is one of the challenges, and, and Graham and I have, have chatted about this before. Um, the, the MOD have been... In many ways, I, I congratulate MOD for being, for, for being broad-minded enough to say this is open to interpretation, which is great because it, it leaves some freedoms for the procurement branch, the commercial branch within MOD to interpret the social values in, in a variety of different ways, depending on the, the contract or the, the procurement that they're running. Um, however, what it does do is it means that it's a bit of a sort of Wild West situation where you could have different approaches from each different procurement team within the MOD. Then you flow it down to the first tier, to the prime contractor. The prime contractor is then free to interpret, broadly speaking, and I'm being slightly, uh, for, for, for effect, Graham, I'm being slightly contentious. Um, but the problem with having sort of freedom to operate across the whole, the whole social values piece is that by the time you're getting down to third, fourth, fifth tier in a complex programme, you, you could have quite... Uh, large divergence from the original sort of header contract um, social values approach. So an example that we saw recently is the Fleet Solid Support Ship, where one consortium had a, a very comprehensive uh, spreadsheet with about 10 sheets on it, uh, each one with 10 questions, and the other one said, tell us about your social values. Um, interesting. So great that it's flexible and it's uh, open to interpretation, but it can be very onerous on an SME that might be bidding into three or four of these contracts or these, uh, these, uh, these procurement activities into three or four different primes, really challenging. And that, that's our job is to ask MOD and to ask ministers and others to think about that and to, and to consider. And I know you have done, Graham, I'm very well aware of that, so I'm not suggesting you haven't at all, but um, that's the kind of thing that, that we need to help government to understand. Um, so I've mentioned briefly uh, that we're looking to, to try and develop some sort of framework where, where companies can assess themselves and have a look um, at, uh, at their strengths and weaknesses within the social values uh, measurements. So what we're trying to do is to develop a sort of common measurement structure. Um, so this will be sort of agnostic from any bid specific questions, but what, it, what we would like to do eventually is for our members to be able to download uh, in effect, a, a, um, a dashboard, which will tell um, both themselves internally, but they can also use that in bids as well as an indication of their social values compliance. Um, and it will help them to identify any, any weaknesses as well. So this is, this is the approach we're taking. Um, so it's gap analysis. 
it's driving internal change and, and improvement in the business. Um, and it's helping to sort of drive short and long term social value strategy. Um, we're looking potentially, this is all going to come out in a, in a questionnaire to our members. So we're going to ask our members to, to come back to us with, with information on this. We're working with a company called Finger on the Pulse Research, which is a business that's come out of the grocery industry. We've nakedly nicked the relationship that MOD had with uh, Finger on the Pulse. They ran an SME survey for, for MOD um, in the middle of last year and we've we've built a relationship with FOTP now they did our own member survey for us and they're now going to help us understand where where perhaps the uh, where the the business case is for the investment in this tool that we're looking to do and then so the tool will basically provide a, a, a make UK wide view of social values and how strong the sector is so we'll be able to give Graham that data and say to him look from our our 350 or so members um, we were able to tell you that actually, you know, there's, there's I don't know, 50% compliance. There's something, you know, there's some really good news there, but actually the gaps are, are in, in various parts. And then what we're suggesting, um, simply because it's quite a big investment for us, is that there'll be a number of pricing models. And, and as you can read there, um, basically the, 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 the prices will, will increase uh, with, in line with the, the detail that you get from the survey. So the, at the very beginning, you're basically being, um, you're looking at uh, your areas of strengths and, and weaknesses uh, compared to the wider Make UK defence membership. Um, Deliverable 2 is, is looking at the sort of gap between the average and the best in class uh, with your business. And then we're up to level uh, to option four, where you're getting a deep dive on each of the social values and identifying exactly uh, the areas that, that perhaps need some, need some work. So that's, that will be launching, I think, next week. The, uh, the survey will come out. So those of you who are members of Make UK Defence, we'd be really grateful if you would complete that and, and send it back. It's only a sort of five, ten minute exercise. And then from that, we'll hopefully flow a much more detailed social values uh, questionnaire, so 35 to 40 minutes worth of, of data. And that will then generate the, the Make UK wide, Make UK Defence wide social values report. And then the other options will flow from there. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to, um, to introduce uh, a, a prestigious uh, panel of speakers. Um, so uh, we're going slightly, uh, I think we're, we're in the wrong order here, but uh, forgive me. So we've got, we've first of all got Graham Hindman, fellow jock. That's good. You know, uh, we like to have a good peppering of Scots at the Make UK conference. Um, so Graham's Director of Commercial Improvement uh, for Defence Equipment and Support, and he's the Senior Reporting Officer for the Implementation of Social Values in Defence. So he is Mr. Social Values when it comes to MOD, which is a big old job, and uh, it's uh, it must uh, must keep you fairly busy, I imagine, Graham. Um, secondly, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Ronnie Ajao. Um, Ronnie, we're, we're, Ronnie's been a member of Make UK for, for a long time, and we're delighted that we've, uh, we're have we now working much more closely with Ronnie. She's our Equality, Diversity and Inclusivity Advisor, um, and working very closely with us on how we develop our social values sort of uh, program, um, and helping us to kind of understand diversity within our own business, as well as with, with our members as well. So we're, we're delighted that, that Ronnie's joined us as well. And I should say, she also is a lecturer at, uh, at the University of Cambridge, got more degrees than you can shake a stick at, um, and runs a very successful uh, public sector uh, consultancy business as well. So a, a woman of many parts. So, uh, and then last, but certainly not least, um, Clancy Murphy from Kemring which is a, one of those wonderful British companies that has a true global leading edge uh, profile across, across the globe, really. A, a very well-known business, a FTSE 250. Um, so we've got the benefit not only of, of looking at SMEs, but also looking at, at listed companies as well. Um, Clancy's got a, a very diverse background, uh, I think, working in, in the consultancy field and then in industry and, and in, in other parts as well. But uh, we're, we're delighted to have you here. And as I say, you're going to talk more broadly on the ESG issue, but with social values tucked in with it, within that. Um, so I would like now, with, uh, without any further ado, to sit down and, uh, 
and welcome Graham to the stage. And um, Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you Thank very you. much. I'll go behind Ron. Sketch in front. Hopefully this will work. This will work, and I won't break the computer. I'll just take my uh, my settings here. Thank you all very much. Um, Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very intimate affair. Uh, so please, if you can't hear me, come to the front a little bit. There's plenty of space. Uh, Andrew, very kindly, let me just move on to the first slide. I'll this. Ah, fantastic. Right. So the, Andrew's touched on you know several parts of this before, so I won't go so over it. Um, the um, uh, public procurement notice was out uh, introducing social value uh, in um, January of 2021. And uh, that's when we started to start thinking about how that's going to be implemented across defence. For us, the vast majority of our, our, our acquisitions come under the DSPCR, which is Defence and Security, Public Contracting Regulations, which keep, and Social Value came into force on that in July. So about a year ago, I was asked to set up a team uh, uh, to try and implement this across defence, which was like, oh, fantastic. Uh, yet another hospital pass seems to be coming my way. Uh, but it was actually one of those hospital passes you think, actually, this is actually pretty good because it can tie together a lot of work that I've been doing under the broader sort of commercial improvements banner where I look after single source pricing, I look after commercial exploitation levy, post costings, tender valuation and a whole raft of other kind of centres of expertise that are all trying to improve the quality of defence procurement and, and also the procurement staff that do it. Um, so the, the, kind of, the cats that I have to look after, there's about 2,000 commercial officers and there's about 17,000 procurement and acquisition staff across defence all have an impact and all have an input into social value and all need to be aware of their responsibilities in setting social value at the very, very early stages when we're thinking about the concept all the way through to going to market and then taking it all the way through to contract management and disposal. That, that social value touches all parts of that and part of the role and remit that we have is to make sure that they understand what those, what those areas are. As Andrew mentioned, the sort of three key priority areas for defence, tackling inequality, fighting climate change and equal opportunities. Uh, that's because they, they most closely resonate and closely link to some really key departmental priorities that we have uh, that support the defence uh, security industry strategy, our, our climate change and sustainability uh, strategic approach and also our defence people strategy. So these are the ones that we felt were the, the, sort of the, the most relevant to, to what we wanted to try and do. Uh, that doesn't preclude the other two. Uh, where it is proportionate and where it is, uh, uh, where it is sort of sensible to do so, the project teams can use different areas of this. But what we're suggesting is when they're thinking of their procurement, when they're doing this work, they kind of focus on these areas as being the sort of priority areas to start with. And if it's relevant or proportionate to what they're buying, and more importantly, what the market is able to cope with, then they can vary that and they have that ability to, to do that. And we spend a lot of time advising them, working with them to do that. Um, I think the key points here are to mention the fact that this is social value which is over and above the normal sort of uh, ESG and, uh, and, uh, and CSR work that you're doing. So this is what additional social value are the, is the acquisition that we, we are sort of hopefully going to engage you on, going to deliver. Uh, and more importantly, you know, how do we make sure that we can, we can quantify that uh, and we make sure that, that, that it's, it's appropriately recognised. As Andrew's mentioned, you know, a minimum of 10% uh, uh, on the overall evaluation weighting is allocated to social value. And anybody who's a keen uh, reader of the National SIP Building Strategy will see that the ministers have really pushed that to 20% in some areas. So it's a real commitment to drive this into what we're doing. And you will recognise if you've read the National Ship Building Strategy, there's a huge amount of national shipbuilding programmed over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so that's a, a real sort of movement on that. Um, the key tenets for us is, is also because it's about uh, it's about the qualitative as opposed to the quantitative assessment. This we feel when the social value is put out is, is a bit more of a levelling playing field between those areas that can invest a huge amount of money and those areas that perhaps can't. So this is a real sort of level playing field for all suppliers, irrespective of size uh, or prior experience of social value, can really come to the fore. Um, just moving on slightly in this. So what we've done at the moment, as I say, we've gone live um, at June of last year to date because of the length of time that it takes for defence procurements to go through. We've got about 62 live contracts with social value criteria have been in place in them, circa £600 million worth of um, uh, contracts um, by value. Um, the three sort of areas that we are focusing on uh, are sort of categorised in, in these chunks. The first one is, is clearly about engagement. So like everything we try and teach everybody in MOD, procurement acquisition is a team sport. 
There's no point in a commercial officer pitching up to say, this is what I'm going to buy, because they'll probably get it wrong. So they need your engineers, you need your technical staff, you need your project delivery, you need your SRO, you need everybody working to this. Social value is exactly the same as what we're trying to do through the Defence Suppliers Forum and all the other forums and, and we're trying to interact with. So it's about collaboration. It's a collaborative effort between us as the buyers and you guys as the suppliers and your supply chain in making sure that we get the right social value cascaded down and we get the right effect that we're trying to create. Um, the, the other parts of this, is, I guess, would be to make sure that also that, the, uh, that we are, we're working with the communities and the supply chain areas that are, are perhaps the, the, uh, uh, the best, sorry, just moving that out of the way, the, the, the best that we want to try and uh, action for. We've set up a defence suppliers forum, uh, of which Andrew is a very vocal and very constructively vocal member. And we have very many other very constructive vocal members on that party. We've got broken that out into various different subgroups that are looking at communications and feedback to make sure that we are telling our own people and also industry. We're sending the right messages and we're doing it in a consistent format to make sure that we are getting, making sure that the training that's out there for our own people and also the training that we're working with uh, industry to provide uh, and give access to is also of the right uh, sufficient quality and quantity. Um, I, myself, am uh, leading a group with, uh, uh, with uh, colleagues from Sodexo around how we evolve and improve the social value um, criteria and social value effect that we're trying to create, because there will be a version two of the social value model at some point in the future, and we want to make sure that we're taking our experience and our learning from that, and we're seen as a real sort of a leader across government, pushing this back into the Cabinet Office to say, this is what we are finding when we are dealing with procurements, because we are buying lots of stuff. We are buying billions and billions of pounds worth of equipment a year. We are including social value in this, and this is what we are seeing. And more importantly, this is what industry are telling us what works and what doesn't work. So we are trying to push that back in there. And also single source, which I will come back on to, um, so, uh, under the sort of challenges area. For us, the real key in this is about early market engagement. And this is about making sure that when the SRO and the project team are having this concept, having this idea, that they test with the market what, can it, what is the best kind of social value criteria to use in the procurement. There's no point in adding in something that is completely disconnected from the market because the market won't bear it and it has no relevance to any of the suppliers that will be in that market. So that's a key element of that and it's a key element of us pushing with the delivery teams to make sure that they, when they are thinking about social value that they do have regular and open and honest engagements with the, with the, with the market around this to make sure that they understand what the, what the art of the possible is and then they can help them shape the procurement, uh, shape that. Um, so from a department point of view, to make sure that we get a real sort of success in this, we have to keep that engagement going and it has to be improved consistently. The challenges that we face, well, Lord Agnew, before he left uh, office, was a real hot component on this, and his, his successor is, is equally, equally keen, as is the rest of the Cabinet Office. And he was very, very complimentary in the work that we've done so far uh, in the year, less than a year that we've, uh, uh, that we've had this, and the, the programme of work that we've got. But he has asked us and every other government department to really strengthen uh, in two particular areas. And that is about internal assurance and controls, uh, quality controls. That's to make sure that everybody in the process understands social value and how important it is. So it doesn't matter if you're in a project team delivering something, quite a, a small piece of equipment, or if you're in a major capability area buying a, a, you know, another aircraft carrier or another uh, um, uh, uh, mobile platform, that you understand what your responsibility is. And if you're in the finance community, if you're in the engineering community, if you're in the project delivery community, you understand your role in this and your role in shaping this. Uh, and also to make sure that our internal assurers, our scrutiny and assurance community also understand their role in making sure that this works and making sure that we've got consistency and quality control throughout. So when we come out to market, we're asking the similar type of questions. It's all phrased in the same way so that you know what to expect. And we don't have the 10 spreadsheet, the 10 uh, uh, element spreadsheet as opposed to the one question. We've got consistency on that. That's going to take us time. Uh, we are a learning organisation. We're a big, big beast of an organisation and it will take us time to get this right. We haven't got it right and we will improve. Uh, and I'll come on to the, sort of, uh, the, the, the final one. The other bit is about measurable commitments and outcomes. So that is, again, for suppliers to, to also make sure that we can manage and collectively demonstrate the value that social value is creating and have that consistent across, across government. So what we want to try and do is make sure that suppliers really understand the, the social value model um, uh, standard reporting metrics and we can use them, we can collectively use them. But most importantly, if, this, the, if the standard reporting metrics aren't right and don't fit, 
please come back and tell us. Don't try and shoehorn something in that doesn't fit, because that's just a waste of everybody's bloody time. So getting that kind of two-way dialogue to say, this, this doesn't really fit for what you're trying to do, because for a couple of years, the project teams are not going to have that experience. That, that muscle memory is not going to be there for them, because it, it, they just haven't used it yet. They'll still fight you tooth and nail and negotiate a contract and beat you down a price, etc., etc. But, but the, the, this is where they need to work on. And, and effectively also to make sure that it's clear and measurable in the deliverables to make sure that we can, through good contract management, make sure that these are actually delivered properly and that we can report that it's been delivered because it won't be long until our internal auditors and the National, uh, uh, the, the National Audit Office will come around and say, right, how much social value has been created in northwest of Scotland? How much social value has created here? How much did this programme create? And that's important for us to make sure that we can engage with the suppliers, the primes who win the contracts, but also that they have the cascaded reporting down their supply chain so that we can quite readily and quite quickly come up with an answer. The answer doesn't have to be to the nth decimal place, but it needs to be better than what we don't really know. So that's why it's really important in the work that we are doing that we get that reporting mechanism. Because the last thing I want for the what 2,000 contracts that we strike per annum just within DNS alone is a cottage industry worth of reporting um, that then I have to get all my commercial colleagues and business colleagues to try and pull together in some kind of inconsistent. So we need some consistency in there. Um, lastly, uh, LFE, learning from experience, we'll sort of understand MOD jargon and continuous improvement. This is about us continually improving what we've got. So we're at version one, we're at the foothills, as I keep on saying to, to Andrew and our colleagues, we're at the foothills of implementing social value. We will get further up, we will get to base camp as we go through this, but it will be a constant process of continually improving what we do. And we've done various things internally. We're uh, developing a whole series of case studies uh, based on what good looks like so we can go back out and tell people, if you're buying this type of service, this is what good looks like. If you're buying this type of equipment, this is what good likes. If you're looking at a capability, this is what good looks like. That's taking us time to generate because uh, just because of the volume, the 63 doesn't necessarily hit the mark of everything we want to do. We've also done a sample review. We've taken a, a, a good representative sample of those 62 and we've looked at what we've gone to market with in the ITNs and the ITTs. Uh, uh, so the ITNs. Uh, and we've looked at that. We've also looked at what was negotiated and what was actually uh, embedded within the contract to make sure that we've got that consistent flow through. Because we have been going for nearly a year, if we're going to do a course correct, we can do a course correct now. We can then update our internal guidance, our internal policy, our internal learning to make sure that we get this right. And those course corrections, we want to try and do on a regular basis rather than having to do major course corrections every year, every two years. Um, and that's the process we're going through. We're also developing a maturity model, which is effectively a framework that we will, we will develop. We're working with a, a whole range of people to make sure that um, we've got... Uh, a, a framework where we can we can assess the effectiveness of what we're doing. The, se the, the centres of expertise that, that we create, they shouldn't be there forever. It should be about imparting the knowledge, building the capability and the skill sets within the, the business as a whole, and then for us to you know, gracefully go and, and, and off to focus on something else. Um, there is a lot of good information uh, on the gov.uk website about social value. There's also on the Defence Suppliers uh, Forums portal, there's a whole raft of Q&As, uh, a, a whole raft of uh, information on there that we've produced. Uh, there's also links and email addresses to uh, Andrew, myself and the rest of the members. If there are any questions, fire them into us and we're happy to uh, help. Thank you very much. Yeah, if, if we could, we've got our slider results, I think. So um, thank you. Uh, yeah, we could do that. Um, so we, the results are now, um, so to, the first question was, to what extent is your business aware of new social value requirements within defence procurement? Fully aware 40%, so we've doubled that proportion from January's result, which was 19, if you remember. Somewhat aware 50%, so that's about the same, I think, slightly lower, um, and not aware 10%. That's not a huge, it's not a huge sample. So. Uh, but it, it, it's an interesting, so there's, there's positive movement still, still forward momentum, which is great. Um, is there another one here, James, or is this? Okay, so then, okay, so the next question then that, that we'll report in in a few minutes um, is what is your business doing in response to the introduction of social values into procurement? Um, are there options below that? 
Yeah, so so we've uh, there's a well you'll see them on on Slido. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six different options um, that you can uh, you can use. So we'd be very grateful if you could just um, fill that out. Thank you very much. Um, so delighted now to uh, to welcome Ronnie to the stage, even though it's not a stage. Um, and uh, over to you. Thank you thank very you much. much. So thank you very much, Andrew, and good afternoon all. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And, and thank you very much, Graham, for the nice opening, because I think he's given me the opportunity on how I'm sort of going to sort of talk about social values. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about social values basically from an experience perspective. And what do I mean by that? In reality, what are the benefits that social value can bring about? And I talk, one, from my own experience, being a woman, being black, and running her own company for 20 years, and also having an interest in the defence sector, and the challenges that I've personally experienced, and hopefully through social values, some of these um, issues can be addressed. And more specifically, what I want to focus on is around equal opportunity. And we talk about equal opportunity, not just as women, but we talk about disability, we talk about so many other aspects. When we started today, we had one of the apprentices, Aisha Mustafa, come up and speak. And we can see the benefits that some of these initiatives that government actually puts into place can bring about. The other thing I'd like to touch on also is through the various sessions today, what we've heard about is about talent. One of the biggest challenges the UK is going to face is about talent. But my question is, do we really have a dearth of insufficient skills in the UK, or is it that we're looking in the wrong places? And I'd like to move towards the latter, because I think there's a lot of talent here in the UK across board. And one of the things I'm hoping social values will do over time is actually help government recognise, introduce initiatives, policies in these areas. So um, let's go. So very quickly, I'm not going to focus on um, talking about um, social values in depth because Graham has actually done that, but I'm going to take it from an equality, diversity and inclusion perspective. And then I'm going to draw on some of the examples, both from the NHS, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, and also from within the MOD, looking specifically at women in defence. And I'll tell you why I've chosen those examples and then just draw to a conclusion. So a lot of the times we talk about equality, diversity, equal opportunities. I think everybody, you it's a talking shop. And why do I say it's a talking shop? Because there is absolutely, there is um, the real drive by government to increase equality, fairness and opportunity for all, eradicate prejudice. I looked around the room today and I came in, it was like, okay, you know, how many me's are there? Very few. But then if somebody doesn't push, and if someone doesn't move this agenda forward, we're not going to get anywhere. And that's one of the things as to why I'm very passionate about this, both because the next generation and the world is changing. And I think um, Lord, um, uh, he mentioned Lord Hague. Hague, thank you. Yes. Lord Hague mentioned that this morning. And also we had Neil, Andrew Neil, who mentioned it. The world is changing immensely. And one of the things we've got to do is be very clever on how we actually attract talent both within the UK and from outside the UK. So to enable us to do that, what we've got to do is eradicate prejudice and discrimination. And also not only that, within the workplace itself, when we talk about social values, a lot of things, and drawing on the examples that I had within the NHS, it's not that people want to treat people unfairly. Sometimes it's a lack of understanding, and this is where education comes in, and what can we do? Now, what does it mean for you as people who are submitting bids? And how does it help you in terms of your um, submissions from a bidding perspective? Because one of the things you've got to think about is how can I ensure that the criteria that I'm filling in from a social values perspective fits and enables us to get the maximum score? So it's not always things that... Um, a very clear cut and when I say clear cut things that are so visible it could be initiatives that haven't actually been thought about but actually help in terms of raising awareness so for instance if you're submitting a bid in say Leeds for example or Bradford where there's a high minority community actually attracting people from those communities to actually be part of the process or to be part of the bidding process would also 
sort of help. So treating people favourably and also those with protected characteristics. So when we look at the social value of EDI, and we've spoken about this quite a lot today, it's about skills. So how can it help? Actually helping people develop skills. One of the things, and I think there are people who work in the police force and recently with Cambridge, I was talking to them and they said one of the things they have challenges both in London and also in Cambridgeshire, dealing with the youths, and especially when it comes to minority youths. Now, one of the things that happens when you approach a young black boy, the chances are the young black boy, his, if he's of African descent, will look down. Why? Because culturally, it's very disrespectful to look at somebody right at home if somebody's senior. Now, from a UK perspective, from a cultural perspective, that would seem as if that individual is dishonest or he's got something to hide. But somebody from Africa would understand he's actually being respectful. So what's the point I'm making? Now, understanding cultures, understanding different skills that people have that may differ can actually help within organisation. So a good understanding of people's backgrounds is fundamental. And this is one of the things that social values is trying to achieve. And I think Graham has already highlighted that. And there are numerous ways that can be done. The other thing, how can social value promote EDI, is innovation. And we spoke about innovation today. Um, it was one of the key things that Lord Haig talked about. Innovation, talent, was the other thing. But innovation, the UK has a strong emphasis at the moment in developing its innovative capabilities and actually building that. So, so allowing individuals to increase the way in which they think, they do think, albeit differently, is also positive. So what we're trying to do here through social values, and I say here um, because I see when I think of where I've come from and what the government's trying to do, I constantly refer to myself in terms of how can these opportunities, and I look at it as an opportunity, definitely. And one of the things um, Graham mentioned was about measurement. One of the key things, and I think this is where government, if I feed this back, I think is, this is where government has lost a trick, is we're very good in putting a lot of initiatives out. So social value is a new initiative. The question is, how do we really measure? And that's one of the things we really need to do, is to think about how do we measure, both quantitatively and qualitatively. But I think the emphasis shouldn't be quantitatively, because, for instance, the NHS, if you go to the hospital, you're allowed to be in the emergency department for four hours. After four hours, they must move you to another part of the hospital. Either you must be seen by a doctor or you must go to triage. And so from a data perspective, they have met the fact that you've seen a doctor or you've seen somebody within four hours. Now, from a quantitative perspective, it makes the NHS look good. But when you look at it from a qualitative perspective, all they've done to meet the targets is just move you from A to B. So the type of ways in which we measure is going to be very important. So the third bit is about openness. So it opens businesses up to new markets. People from different backgrounds provide new knowledge and different ways of doing things. And finally, it improves brand reputation. So by introducing diversity, so one of the things um, Andrew said, he's very keen for me to be here as um, a person driving the equal opportunities agendas, looking at these, advising, absolutely. So from that perspective, we're driving something forward. So another... Um, so we're talking about the social values of EDI. Oh, what's happened? Technology, absolutely, that's better. So it hasn't failed me, good. So I'm talking about the NHS. So we recently, and this is where you see social value in practice, um, MOD, submission, the small company, if you're submitting um, a bid, you know, it's a long procurement process, on average 18 to 24 months. If you're a small company, that's a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of effort. So the key question is you need to get it right. So I draw an example within the NHS. So we recently submitted a bid for um, the NHS, and it was looking at how, in terms of skills, um, a big sort of medium-sized trust in London 
um, with about a thousand staff. In the thousand staff, and we were asked to sort of come up with a way in which they can improve equality and diversity across the organization. Because with a thousand staff, they only had one, one senior member who was from the minority community. But the key there, and why did I use this as an example? Because from a social value perspective, in terms of the bid, what we were able to do was to highlight, prior to us submitting the bid, doing some research on the trust, highlight some of the challenges we felt that trust had and things that they were not doing that they could implement at relatively small budgets to make a significant change. Nice thing was our bid obviously was successful. But the beauty of it, and what I was trying to demonstrate here, was the fact that it was through social value. It was the social value criteria that we added to make that difference within that submission. Now, the other one that we want to draw on is women in defence. Another example. Um, I don't know how much you know, but we've had Graham here. Oh, one of the... <laughs> and he's wearing his bag very proudly. Um, like I said, I started working, doing little projects for well over 20 years. My first project within um, government was in the Ministry of Defence. And I noticed, number one, obviously lack of representation, women, hardly any, um, but then talk about a black person, even far and few between. But over the years, that has changed immensely. And credit to Angela Owen, women in defence and a few other women, one of the things they've tried to do is to increase the representation of women in the defence sector. And now they've actually successfully launched the target of having 30% representation within the Ministry of Defence within 30 by 2030. That's good. How does that relate to social value? Because again, we're looking at different numbers. We're looking at a proportion of the sector of society that's not well represented and coming up with different initiatives, different policies to encourage representation within the marketplace. So what would I say, if I was going to conclude, is that social value definitely has immense benefits because not only does it increase the type of workforce that you have within organizations, yes, it may be a challenge for a small business and small medium-sized companies, but the key thing, the test of it, is to think, when you are submitting your bid, what's so unique about that community that you need to identify that you can do the greatest good for the greatest number of people? That's what social value is about. It's about how can you, in a nutshell, in simple language, I look at it, the social value is how can you do the greatest good for the greatest number of people in the most cost-effective way to change and increase a better workforce, that's one. On top of that, we spoke about data because you need to prove. So we have all these policies and this is one of the things that I think the government really needs to think about is how does it actually measure the success of its policies? Because from outcomes, you can actually measure how successful the policies are. And one of the things that um, Andrew mentioned was the sort of using data to sort of test. So both data, qualitative and quantitative. And my preference is to actually use the quantitative as a starting, but use the qualitative really as a richness, because that's where the value really comes in. And also, greater pay transparency, it generates that, creates that, and we can see already in government we've got um, different sort of policies that encourage transparency against the gender pay gap, for instance, as an example. And finally, it enables us to work with industry on various policies to understand how these policies can encourage greater working relationships, um, and especially in the sector of manufacturing. So social policies, social values, definitely a positive. Um, and I use it when I look back, I can see, even though they're little, they normally say from little acorns, great oaks grow. It will take time, but we'll get there slowly and surely. So thank you all very much. And now I'd like to... Ronnie, thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. So the, the make, thank you, Ronnie, that was fascinating. Um, <coughs> make UK Defence is hopefully living, living the, uh, the experience. We now have a team that's got more women than men in it, which is very important. Um, 
our latest uh, recruits. Well, we've got two of them here, James and Estelle. Um, and our apprentice is, is originally a family from the Ivory Coast. And she's brought a whole new dimension to our team, uh, not just because she's very skilled at digital marketing, but really from a whole cultural perspective as well. So we're, we're, uh, we're really, we're living that, uh, living that dream really in, in many ways. So we're delighted to be, to be doing that. Um, finally, uh, Clancy, we'd love to hear from you and, uh, and pass over to you. And thanks so much for joining us. It's a slightly bizarre it's slightly setup, bizarre, isn't it? It's yeah. a slightly bizarre. I'd emerge from behind the screen. How do I? Is there a widget? Or do I press a button? If you just click on that one. Ah, okay, very good. Thank you. There we are. That's me. Hello. I'm not sure if it's good going last or not good going last. But it's, it's really uh, lovely to be here. Andrew, thank you for including me. I did a, a quick look at all the speakers today and I'm the only Chief People Officer, which either means that Make UK is very anti-HR or I'm in a very privileged position. So I'm, I'm hoping it's the latter. The perspective that Andrew's asked me to bring today is, is to talk a bit about how this works in industry. And I have to put my hand up and say the social values proposition is not new to Kemp, but it's not something we've had to use very often yet. And that's because of, of the sort of tolerance of five million pounds of being the sole source. However, what we are doing at Kemring is making sure that we're ready. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is a, a little bit about some of the things we've been doing within the organisation, which I'm hoping will resonate for those of you who work in SMEs or are, have this on your agenda. Because I'm talking very broadly, I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that Ronnie's talked about there, about diversity, but also more broadly about one of the key challenges within industry at the moment, which I think has been mentioned a number of times today, which is about talent and the lack of it. And I think this all links together. So I'm the Chief People Officer for Kemmering. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who Kemmering are, because although Andrew very generously said you all know who we are, I bet you don't. Uh, so I can tell you a tiny, tiny bit to just put it in context. But then I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work we've done, which links the ESG agenda. Um, remembering we, I work in defence, I'm sure some of you also work in defence. Until about three months ago, we were sin stock. Uh, everyone's pretty interested in defence again now. Uh, but there are, there are a number of challenges that come with that, and, and not least around attracting talent. But also because of the environment that we work in, I'm, I'm almost as unique as Ronnie, um, because I'm a girl and there aren't many of us. So um, that, that is one element of diversity we're looking at. There are many others actually, and, and I'll bring out what some of those are. So this is a sort of a snapshot view from industry. Um, please bear in mind, that's just my bit of the industry. Okay, so here we're Kemmering. So put simply, we exist to make the world a safer place. That's a great, that's a great statement, isn't it? Uh, but what we do is we're a group of key people and together we design we develop and we manufacture services and products which make the world a safer place, they're protection systems, and we keep people, communities and countries safe. We've got a pretty strong set of core values, safety, excellence, innovation, they're pretty simple. Uh, we all understand what they are, you see them down the side there. And we have some pretty awesome colleagues all around the world uh, and we do amazing things every day to deliver on our promise to our customers. Our customers tend to be MOD and Departments of Defence. We are UK based, we're a UK FTSE company. However, we have large footprint in the US, in Australia and in Norway. We look around corners that you probably didn't know were there. Uh, a lot of what we do is in the background, we listen and we construct solutions. Those solutions might be a physical asset, something in the electronic warfare space, for example, or a countermeasure that will stop an inbound missile, but it's also in the cyberspace and we do an awful lot of work with national security. A lot of what we do you'll never hear of, and that's a really good thing. A lot of the threats that we spend a lot of time thinking about, we hope never come to pass. But what that means is, as a group of colleagues, we're pretty eclectic. Everything from an operator based in the deep south in America who is making a physical countermeasure with high explosives, to a, someone with more PhDs than Ronnie, uh, sitting in a basement somewhere in Hampshire, I can't tell you where, who never sees the light of day, but comes up with amazing things to stop bad people getting into our security systems. So what you can see up there is a selection of my colleagues. I've done that on purpose. I have amazing colleagues. They are awesome. They're awesome because as a complete body, they're so passionate about what we do. And the guy in the NASA t-shirt, we do an awful lot in space with SpaceX and NASA. Uh, the ladies at the top there who work for an organization within our group called Roke, um, they're apprentices, the ladies there. Uh, the 
two ladies on the left there work in our facility in Tennessee. Uh, we have some pretty cool colleagues. Why is there a sheep on the screen? <laughs> sheep don't work for us. Is but we're pretty limited. Is that, is that programming me, the Scottish interest? It's a little bit of Scottish interest. Scottish and Welsh. So the, the very quickly, why is there a sheep on the screen? Well, the sheep and this guy here uh, are based in our Australia facility. Why have we got sheep in Australia? Well, there's a lot of sheep in Australia. When lockdown came along, um, our facilities, our manufacturing facilities in particular, are multiple hundreds of acres. So the facility in Australia is a 250 acre facility, it's in the bush. One of the key challenges for facilities of that scale um, is that there's lots of open space, and lots of open space means grass and vegetation. And so on our payroll, we have large numbers of maintenance staff who frankly are gardeners, and they turn up with their machinery and they mow the grass. And when you're manufacturing high hazard material like high explosive, the last thing you want is a bushfire, whether that's in Scotland or Australia. So we're very, very focused on the safety element of keeping the vegetation down. When COVID came along, we had to stop unexpected visitors on site, but also external contractors, which meant that we canned all our gardening contracts. So then what do you do? Well, if you're in Australia and you buy a flock of sheep, and that's what we did, we bought a flock of sheep and they grazed the facility, which is fantastic. Sheep have babies. So then we had lots of lambs. Uh, and then we had lots of people very interested in looking after the lambs and we had a lot of lamb poo, frankly, uh, a lot of sheep poo too, which is a bit of a hazard on site. So we swept it all up and we created gardens. And so our Australian facility now has a permanent flock of sheep, which has a breeding programme, and has a permanent gardening facility, which is quite a large part of our wellbeing agenda. But that's one of the innovative things that came out of lockdown. So I won't talk any more about sheep, but that was quite an interesting thing that came out. Just a little bit more about Kemmering. Uh, oh, hold on. There's a slide missing. Oh yeah, perhaps there isn't a slide missing, I don't know. Might have been deleted. What's our social value, um, ESG, social values and Kemmering people? So ESG is quite important to us. Uh, we are listed on the UK Stock Exchange. Uh, that means we've got lots of investors, not just Mrs. Miggins with her four shares in Kemmering, but big institutional investors, pension funds, um, and some of our big top holders have a large number of our shares. ESG, uh, for those of you who are involved in the PLC world, is quite a big story at the moment. So uh, we have to prove to our investors our environmental credentials. We have to comply with a large amount of regulation. Um, we have to prove our social credentials, which is really what we're talking about today. And also we have to be very compliant around governance. No big news, we're a defence company and uh, our investors get very upset if we sell things to sandy places that might get into the wrong hand. So governance is super important. But ESG also talks a lot to what we're trying to achieve in social values, which is those, those five things that Graham mentioned, picked out the three that we're particularly focused on. I haven't highlighted fighting climate change. It's not because it's important, not important. In fact, it's the number one ESG agenda item at Kemmering at the moment, and we're doing a huge amount. A lot of what we do is both dangerous, so that, that's not great if you're working in it, but also potentially very polluting. Um, our facilities are generally powered by steam, because uh, steam is less explosive than any other power source. Uh, steam comes from water, water needs to be heated, and therefore we use a huge amount of energy. So we're doing a lot around uh, tackling our, our energy footprint, and we are moving to green energy. In Norway, all of our energy is green, because it's hydro, uh, which is helpful. So we are doing stuff around climate change. However, the three things that I wanted to focus on uh, were tackling economic inequality, equal opportunities, and well-being. And that actually does link very well to the ESG agenda. I'm not trying to retrofit, but it, it does. And those three things influence massively the people strategy at Kemmering, which is my job. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is a little bit about what we're doing in each of those, which I'm hoping might resonate with some of the things you're doing or trying to do. Oh, there we are, that's the slide I was looking for. So very briefly, that's us. Uh, we're in four countries. Um, we have... Uh, multiple locations. We've got two and a half thousand employees at 11 facilities in 14 locations. Um, and our facilities are very, very diverse, um, as are our clients. Uh, we deliver to clients in over 50 countries around the world. That gives us a number of logistical challenges. Um, and our capabilities span everything through defence and security, also into commercial, which is where space comes in. So when we're thinking about the Kemmering population and the work that we're doing around supporting that population, 
Ronnie picks up a really good point. It always had to start with data. So who are our population? And this really has influenced how we are looking at the social value we can create, but also some of our talent challenges. So we've got more than two and a half thousand colleagues. We're based in four countries. Those colleagues are 70% male and 30% female. That percentage endures at every level of our population broadly. So our population really divides into quite a broad triangle. The largest part of our population, about 1,800 colleagues, are operators or individual contributors. So they work on the line or they're individual engineers. They are 70, 30, male and female. The next slice of our population are our line managers and supervisors, there's 350 of them globally. They are 28% female and 72% male. The next slice of our population is our management population, our senior managers and our executive team. That is 26% female and 74% male. So it broadly is the same all the way through the organisation. The only place it's different is our main board, where we have far more women. So we have about 34% female at main board level. But that in itself is a challenge. We've got multiple identified ethnic backgrounds. Why have I written it that way? Well, because people don't have to tell us their ethnic background. In the US they do because of the um, regulations around being a government contractor. In the rest of the world they don't. And in Norway it's illegal to ask. Now, this is a really interesting one because the investment population is really interested in our ethnic diversity. So I said to them, well, good news. In our facility in Tennessee, we are 90% black. That's fantastic. Why didn't you tell us that? Well, because our local community outside the facility is 100%. And if you look at the population within the organisation, there are no individuals of colour, of any colour, in our senior leadership team in Tennessee. So therefore, I think that's a bad thing. I'll give you another example. In Norway, we have one person of colour in our facility in Norway. So that's rubbish. I said, yes, but there are no people of colour registered in the three communities that touch that site. And that one person is on the senior leadership team. So actually, I think that's a good thing. So you have to be really careful with data. And we're also very, very careful about what we report and how we report it. We also have a very significant number of neurodiverse colleagues. And this is another big area of diversity for us. So one of our businesses, we'll talk about this in a moment, there's 10 of them. One of our businesses is an organisation called Roke. Roke is in the cyber security and national security space broadly, and also electronic warfare, so systems and technology. Within our Roke business, 60% of my colleagues identify as on the autistic spectrum. 60%. It's huge. And those are just the ones that have told us. Outside of that, we know there's a very large proportion who are dyslexic or dyspraxic or have ADHD. That is a very unusual population to be managing and therefore the requirements of that population are different. But when you're thinking about that population, they're hired because they are the best in their field. So when we're going out and we want to hire more of them, how do you attract them? How do you attract neurodiverse individuals? Does our approach to recruitment <coughs> attract them? Does our approach to graduates make it feel welcoming? When we had to lock down, how do you make that transition easy for someone who is autistic because change isn't always an easy thing to go through. So that's really interesting for us. We have over 150 current graduates and apprentices in the UK. So that's a big population. That's about 10% of our UK population of graduates and apprentices. 100% of our line managers participate in leadership programmes. It is non-negotiable. If you have a position as a line manager, you have to go through the global line manager programme. And 100% of our senior leaders have to undertake DEI education at least once a quarter. So that's a little bit of information about understanding our population, and it's it's quite a challenging one. So what about DEI? How are we specifically focusing on that? I joined Kemring in December 2017. Um, full disclosure: I have nothing in my background which talks about defence or manufacturing. I came from the city where I spent 25 years working in private equity and professional services firms. DEI in those organisations is fundamentally different to DEI in an organisation like Defence. But what it meant was I myself was very diverse. There's two women in our senior leadership team. I'm one of them. The other one, helpfully, has worked in Defence an awfully long time, so, so she could help me. So I myself was already diverse, but what I brought to the board was a conversation around, but that's okay, isn't it? Because you hired me. You could have hired any chief people officer, but you hired me. There were loads who had defense background or manufacturing, but you hired me, why was that? And that creates a really great conversation. 
the data element of what we just talked about there um, in the previous slide became super important because the very first thing we need to do when we're thinking about how to create a really inclusive and diverse organisation is think about the information. So one of the first things we did, I did, in January 2019 as I launched a group-wide global review of what does it feel like to work at Kenran. Now we probably call it a culture review, but we didn't call it that. We just went out and we spoke to about 700 colleagues one-to-one -one, over three months and asked them, what does it feel like to work here? It's a very basic question, just one question. We got the most amazing amount of information and data. And that was super helpful because that then helped us create an education program. Some people said, well, I work here because my dad worked here, my granddad worked here, and it's pretty much the only place I thought of working. And it's not that great, actually, to be honest, I don't really like it, but, you know, it pays and I've got no other ideas. Other people told us they really enjoyed working, they can do the best work of their career, but we've said we were getting in their way. We weren't making life easy. So we got a lot of information, and from that information we created some education. The education then helped us look at what development interventions we might need, and now we're starting to look at role models, networks and mentors, because as Ronnie very rightly said, if you can't see someone who looks like you, it's really unlikely you'll be able to achieve what you want to achieve. You need to be able to see someone in front of you who does what you do. So this, this very, very basic, um, you know, it really is quite basic, approach to diversity, equality and inclusion started with three years of focusing on inclusion, which is our culture programme. That culture programme did a number of things, but in particular, it gave us the opportunity to think about how do we want it to feel like to work here. I talk too much, Andrew. I did tell you that when you asked me to talk. We all we all talk. So very quickly, we did a lot of work around development. This is our this is a picture of who works here, which I've talked to already. Eighteen hundred operators, graduate apprentices, about one hundred and fifty, um, and then our senior teams. And part of our DEI approach, and actually looking at the equality piece, is if we can provide development at every level, then we give people the opportunity to move up through the levels. So we put in place a number of development schemes, a number of development programs. Every part of the organisation now has the opportunity for development. And we also create a huge amount of engagement. So on the left hand side there, you see all the postcards. Those are different things that we've done um, around well-being and positivity, saying thank you, which is really important bringing in education around mental health and well-being. But the most important thing for me is the bit on the right there, that phone. We put in place an engagement survey. It's a pulse survey. It goes out to every single colleague every three days. And it asks us different, set, different statements. Every three months, all the, all the statements rotate and we get daily dashboards. And that's helped us understand why, how all the interventions we've done have helped change the dial on how does it feel to work here. And the final thing that we knew from doing the culture survey is that people were very connected with their local communities. And so we've done a lot of work looking at how do we increase those connections. Because increasing connections to local community increases the level of engagement. It also gives us the opportunity to reach into the community and find new talent. So our social values in action are significantly linked to the development work we've done around our people agenda and this whole approach of we are Kenran. Just to pull out a couple of things that we haven't talked about there. Talent is our biggest issue. Okay, talent either comes fully formed, we can hire from the market, it's ready, it can just drop in and work, or it comes as graduates and apprentices and we can train them. But there's also a massive middle section of communities. People who are coming back from a career break, who want to do a career change, who have had a change in circumstances and want to do something different. So we put together an academy and the academy works with a number of external organisations to bring us individuals who are very bright and very motivated but might not have the skill set that we need today. So we call them the almost readies. So we've got graduates and apprentices, we've got fully fledged ready to land and we've got almost readies. That's been our biggest impact in local communities because we're starting to get a name as an organisation who will take you if you've got the right attitude and you want to learn. A lot of what we heard this morning was about things like apprentice levies and we've started to do a lot of work to look at how can we persuade government to convert the apprentice levy into further education funding? Because it is different. Because that would really help organisations like ours fill this talent gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy.
we just say a big thank you to, to all, the, all the speakers? So um, thank you very much for taking, taking the time to, to come and speak to us. Um, we're slightly over time, so that's my, my poor chairmanship, I'm afraid. Um, very briefly, uh, we asked the question, what's your business doing in response to the introduction of social values into defence procurement? 56% said understanding what social values means for our business. So there's still that sort of education piece and beginning to sort of understand what's going on. Um, understanding what social values means for our suppliers. So deep diving into your supply chains, 22% said that was what they were looking at. Um, ensuring social values are embedded in investment programmes, only 11%. Um, zero for the next two, which is uh, ensuring social values are embedded in suppliers' investment programmes. So of looking at the governance side of supply chains um, business is planning to start work around it in the next six months zero percent um, and 11 percent saying my business is not actively doing anything and has no plans at the moment so interesting they may well be from the chem chemring uh, position where perhaps they're not running uh, many competitive tenders